Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we're on to the Greco-Persian Wars today. Last week we covered... Well, I say last week. I know our timing is a little bit wibbly-wobbly lately with one thing and another, but last time, shall we say, we talked about Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and the Restoration, and so we're getting into the Hellenistic period. Hellenic almost period. Hellenic period. Sorry. They, they should be the same thing, but they're not. They're very different things, <laughs> in fact. Yeah. The Hellenic period. This is when Greece is rising to the top of the world, mm-hmm. overcoming Medo-Persia. And we're going to talk about that process today, the Greco-Persian Wars. I think, is Marathon the first? Yeah, no, there's, there's an interesting thing about that. Uh, Wikipedia allows us to see what the world of scholarship said as of about a year ago, you know, before <laughs> it gets up, updated and changed again. And, and as I was I was flipping through Wikipedia, refreshing my memory, uh, that and, and other sites as well said, yeah, uh, a marathon is the turning point of the Greco-Persian Wars. And I said, what? <laughs> as far as I know, it's the first major battle. What? Is it the first major battle that the Greeks won? And that's why it's the first one that we remember? Uh, essentially, yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> okay. even, but even so, <laughs> it, it, in many ways, it was... here. Okay, here's the thing. And we haven't talked about Greece yet to lay in all the background. So mm-hmm. some of this, people out there, you got to take this by faith and we'll try to fill in the gaps as we go, as we talk about Greece. And that's going to take a while. The Greeks were defined not so much by the uh, peninsula and isthmus on which they lived, but by their descent from common ancestors, their participation in Olympic Games, their common language, and so on. They were Japhetic people who had split into many groups, and many of them eventually made it to what we today call, at least the rest of the world calls Greece. They still call themselves Hellas after their mythical or historical ancestor, Helen, uh, possibly the one that uh, the Bible calls Elisha. Elisha. Uh, but they, somewhere back in there, there was, there was this common Japhetic ancestor. But the people didn't all splash down in Greece. Some of them settled along the, Tur- the coast of what we call Turkey, Asia Minor. And, and so when Persia came along and began conquering its world, Asia Minor was high on the list of things to be conquered, and Persia did that quite successfully. Uh, there were all, there was already a kingdom in charge of a lot of this called Lydia. And if you read, read Herodotus, it gives all kinds of background about Lydia and their king. This is the king who d- didn't listen to the, um, the oracle about if you go to war, you'll destroy a great nation. So <laughs> the Greeks had not, the Greek city states along in there had not been terribly independent to begin with. And Persia came along and subdued everything. And after a while, those Greek city-states decided that the rulers that Persia had put in place to keep an eye on them were not people they liked a whole bunch. And they began to, one by one, throw off these, the Greek word is tyrant. A tyrant simply is somebody who seized a kingdom without proper authority. Here, the proper authority would be Persia. And then, yeah. Um, so... And in doing this, they realized we're up against the mightiest empire on on the earth. Maybe we should whistle for some help. And they whistled to the Greek mainland. And only Athens and one other city-state responded, but but they began sending weapons and troops and such and supplies to the point that eventually they took out what was now the Persian city of Sardis and burned it to the ground. The Persians didn't appreciate this, came in and chased them off. And we re- subdued the city. So technically, these were Greek peoples. They just weren't from Greece. They shared the same ancestor and ancestry and background, but they were not living on the Greek mainland, except for Athens and, and the other city-state whose name I forget. Um, and so it's at this point that Darius or Darius or whatever you want to call him, Darius the Great, looks across and says, oh, there's more of these guys. And they're kind of interfering in my empire. Uh, I need to tell them to knock that off. They need to recognize who they're dealing with. And so he sends a little message that says, um, give me some of your land and water as symbols of tribute and Athens and Sparta throw the guys into 
wells and ditches and such and says, there's your water and earth, ha. And that initiates or precipitates the Battle of Marathon. So had there been conflicts? Yeah, but not with the Greek mainland particularly. They were primarily with the Ionian city-states in Asia Minor, in Turkey. Uh, somehow growing up and going through high school and college, I missed all of that. I mean, I knew I knew that was there, but I never heard anyone say that that's where the Greek wars actually began. Because, you know, in simple nationalistic fashion of someone born in the 20th century, Greece is Greece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, not so much then. So, yeah, the, the Greek wars had begun. And so, in that sense, Marathon is a turning point in that the Greeks win. And therefore, yes, the historians highlight it as, wow, isn't this great? Because this is where the champions of freedom and rationality begin to turn the tables on the forces of despotism and luxuriousness and all paganism and all that. <laughs> uh, Which it's interesting because in <laughs> some ways the Greeks do owe the Persians things because the Persians push towards to go more Western to the mainland of Greece forces the city-states to stop fighting each other and instead fight the Persian threat, such as Sparta and Athens, that many other city-states were regularly at war with one another. And so there was, mm -hmm. there were, they had a lot of their own problems. And so Marathon <laughs> yeah. is one of those times where they kind of, they stop and actually look at an outside threat rather than their neighbors. Um, mm. And we're we're told that Athens looked to Sparta and said, "Come and help us, because yes, here's an outside threat. We can all get behind turning them back." But the Spartans apparently were observing some kind of religious festival in the oh, moon yes. or something, and <laughs> thus could not come. They were late. They could not come at that point. And the Athenian armies met the Persian forces at this plain called Marathon. The Greeks, the Athenians had superior advantages in some ways and apparently superior tactics. They, But both sides waited for the other to make a move. The Greeks had forced the battle in a place where the, the Persian cavalry and the Persians were really good with horses, and firing arrows off horses and all that. The, 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 it was a, a marshy plain with some, with some hard and high ground that the, the, the horses really couldn't get into. So they, the Persians didn't want to commit so much without their horses and the Greeks were waiting for the Persians to do something and they're looking back and forth. And then depending on who exactly you believe it, how you interpret it, the Persians apparently pulled their horses back and said, well, I can't use them anyway. Let's put them on the ships and send them on. They can attack Athens, which is now deserted because the army's here, mm. um, while we, we deal with these people. So that or something triggered the Greek assault. The Greeks, are, the Greeks take credit for being the ones who started this. They may have been responding to that, or maybe the Persians said, well, let's go get them. The Greeks said, fine, they're out in the open. Let's get them now. Battle happens. Persians lose rather badly. Uh, there are lots of mythical stories that go along. People claim to see King Theseus of, you know, the labyrinth and the Minotaur and all that, mm. uh, fighting ghost-like with his armies against the Persians. And other such manifestations, whether we should put any credit in there, or, 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 or are we facing demonic delusions, or do people just like to good, you know, ghost stories? Don't know. <laughs> uh, when it was over, and, and again, there are multiple versions. At least we got some written records. They just don't all agree with each other. The um, a messenger was sent back to Athens to say, in so many words, they'd be Greek. We won. Uh, the later stories say that he ran the distance, which was about 40 uh, kilometers, 26 miles, and uh, discarded everything he could along the way so he could get there and, and make it. And he pushed and he pushed and it was hard. And he's losing his breath and his heart's beating hard against his chest. And he burst into town and says, we won, and falls down dead. <laughs> Whether or not that actually happened, we don't know. Later, it's repeated in the writings of Plutarch, but the earlier writers don't mention the, the dying part. So anyway, that runner's journey later on by older historians, and then again at the end of the 19th century, will be raised to the level of um, athletic myth. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Olympic Games didn't have a marathon. Because that was kind of long. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but the new Olympics, in order to gain public support and prestige and to impress the world, said, let's put a really, really long race in there. How long? Well, get that, that, that marathon thing. How long was that? It was about 40 kilometers. Well, let's, yeah, let's do something like that. It eventually settled down to the exact measurements it has today when it was, when the Olympics were held in England. And Queen Alexandra wanted it to start on the lawns of Windsor Castle so the little royals could look out and watch. <laughs> and then come back around to where the royal box was set at the end, which was a little further than where the finish line had been, so that the royals could be there to see the end of the race. At least that's it the story. seems like good reasoning to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at, from that point on, that fixed the exact length of what a marathon would be. I was reading through my history notes and saw, hmm. I don't say any of that. I need to go back and edit my history notes, apparently. Well, I'm teaching world <laughs> history next year, so give me a chance. Yeah, that so was one the, of my moments of having uh, my younger year history class um, mind blown because I always, uh, either I had assumed or I had been taught that the the particular length that that runner had gone was 26.2 miles, and that's why yeah. it was that. And so I saw somewhere else that it was 25 miles or 40 kilometers, and I went, no, no, I know this. It's 26.2. Yeah. What? What's wrong? <laughs> and so I started doing the same thing and went, oh, that, okay. That, that's a little bit of a letdown. All right. <laughs> but if you're uh, an Anglophile, it's great. Let's <laughs> yeah, let England define the. It's Olympics one more sports. piece of trivia for when we eventually all go on Jeopardy and just yeah. take the, yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, this, uh, this upset Darius's plans. He withdrew most of his armies who got sick along the way and then he died. And, and that was a rather dismal end to his enterprising career. Uh, his successor is named Xerxes, Xerxes the first. He's, um, the son of Darius, I believe. And he decides, well, you know, that this, we started well. Bigger army, better preparation, a little more strategy and tactics. These weak people are annoying. We need to take them out. And so one of the problems was the Greeks aren't great at a lot of things, but they do have a navy and they do have a rugged coastline. It, it, it's not exactly always easy to get your ships to there and disembark your people and get them settled without being harassed or, or threatened. So Xerxes says, well, let's just march there, more or less. And so he had his army march to the Dardanelles, that little strait that separates um, Asia Minor from um, the Macedonian uh, coastline, and arrange for little floaty things that they could just walk over to get to where they belong, barges and, and, and such. And he brought his army down from the north. And this is, again, a story that probably every school child still knows, despite our horrible education system, because it's been <laughs> in the movies. I believe the last movie was called The 300. Did anyone remember oh, that? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is Sparta. Yeah, that one. yeah, yeah. this is Sparta. Um, mm -hmm. This time, Sparta was ready to fight. Uh, but... Uh, Xerxes found himself going through a very, very narrow pass, Thermopylae, where there were hot springs, which is what thermos, <laughs> uh, means. Um, and the, the, the Spartans and friends, because it wasn't just Sparta there. We're often told, oh, it was just these 300 Spartans against millions or whatever. No, there was, there were a lot of city states that were represented, but the Spartans prided themselves on being the best warriors in Greece. And so they were going to take the point here. And uh, when it was time to withdraw, they stayed, but they weren't even the only ones who stayed to fight. They were the ones who stayed and fought and died to the last man. You know, give them credit for credits too. Uh, they, were, they were formidable warriors. And Xerxes found very quickly that whereas his soldiers, his immortals, they were called, uh, could take out anybody if you could just send enough of these immortals at your at your enemy army, you could wipe them out. Unfortunately, there's this little narrow pass thing, <laughs> and you can't get many people through at a time. And the Greeks were fighting for their lives. They were fighting with their family. They were fighting for their homes and their future. Because if the Persians got through, it looked like that would be the end of everything. Uh, and for a, a day or so, they held it successfully. But then a traitor 
um, went to Xerxes and said, uh, hey, your majesty, there's a way around all this. There's this mountain pass. Let me show you guys, and I'm sure you'll be very generous with your rewards. And so this trader, I don't remember his name anymore, but he shows the, although it be, in Greek it becomes a Satanism, it becomes that Satan, a synonym for the boogeyman. Don't, huh, don't, mothers would tell children, don't do that or the boogeyman, this guy will, will come and get you. Because they couldn't mm -hmm. think of any more e thing more evil than mm -hmm. betraying all of Greece for money. I think his name was Ephialtes. I'll Ephi go with that. I, I probably didn't pronounce it correctly, but <laughs> I'm at least reading the letters that are there. Okay. Well, <laughs> good. I don't think I've ever seen it in print. I've just heard it pronounced. It's been a long time. Um, and and once the the Spartans realize uh, we got a problem here, they do tell the other Greeks to go home. Many do. Uh, some stay, and the Spartans fight uh, a rearguard action to the last men. And yes, there were about 300 of them, and it goes down in history as one of the great battles for freedom and such. Well, from their point of view, it was, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But with that done, the Spartans have a clear shot to Athens. Was that uh, Thermopylae, was that where uh, Molon Labe came into use? Was that the famous Spartan response? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come and take it. Yeah. You, you, you. So, yeah. You see that sometimes on like bumper stickers or something when people have done Spartan races. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Missed that. Don't do Spartan races. <laughs> Athens is wide open. And they they are very concerned because the Spartan or Spartan allies are down and out. They send to the Oracle at Delphi, and again we're assuming a lot here. We're assuming that you know that Sparta is a Greek city, and you know what the Oracle at Delphi is, and we'll fill in all of this later when we get there. So for now, pretend you understand if you don't. <laughs> um, the Oracle was an Oracle of Apollo. Um, he revealed himself to a particular priestess who under the influence of certain fumes from the earth or someplace. Piped in from elsewhere. <laughs> Piped in from elsewhere. Would go into trances and babble things and the priest would interpret for the inquirer um, what, what the message from Apollo was. Uh, the first message was not too hopeful, but then the oracle spoke again and it seemed at the end like there was something. It had to do with your safe behind wooden walls, and something about Salamis, which was uh, a bay around about the city. And, and people weren't quite sure what to make of that. Uh, a military leader who would quickly become an admiral, Themistocles, stood up and said, well, isn't it obvious? Wooden walls, those would be ships. So what we need to do is put everybody in ships and get them out in, in, in the bay in Salamis and take on the Persians there. It didn't take a lot of convincing when eventually the Athenians went along with it. So when the Persians arrived, they found the deserted Athens. And they saw ships out in the harbor waiting and smiling, saying, come and get us, as it were. Um, and they had sent to the Persian navy ahead so that they would come in. And so there would be this this immediate war, and there was. And it turned out that the Persians really weren't great on boats. <laughs> the Greeks actually were seafarers. Um, they had so vandalized their own land, stripping it of all of its uh, vegetation and uh, and such, that there was there really, in, in the Greek mountains, there wasn't much room for, for farming or grapes or olives in the long run. And so sea trade was major. So they had become really good with boats, ships. Um, and they managed to take out the Persian Navy. And then the Persians met them again in one last battle called Plataea. And there the Greeks delivered a final decisive defeat to the Persians. And the Persians went home and left the Greeks alone. And we'll pick up the Greeks um, and, and, and fill in space later. But now we need to finish with Persia. As far as Western culture is concerned, this is usually where the history books jump ship, so to speak, and follow <laughs> Greece. And Persia gets left behind except for a footnote of, oh yes, 
when Alexander came, there was still this thing called the Persian Empire. We're not going to do a whole lot better because as far as scripture is concerned at this point, there really is not much in the way of prophecy after Xerxes. Uh, the Persians begin, go into moral and spiritual decline and are no longer guarding God's people the way they need to be. They're not actively persecuting them, but they're not particularly useful. And God has other plans. God has things to set in motion. Uh, Daniel spoke of this. This is in uh, chapter 11. The angel comes in and says, um, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persian, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Now I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So that would be uh, Cambyses. So the, Darius the Mede is, is Cyrus, then Cambyses, Bardia, who may who claimed to be his his brother but may not have been, and then Darius. Oh, and for the first time, I also saw on Wikipedia that Darius was accused of being a usurper. He believed that Bardia was the usurper, as, as did his fellow mm -hmm. generals, and that they were simply restoring order. And I'm sure there's a lot of things you can argue back and forth there that I don't care about. The Bible simply says there, there's there's these three kings, and there's a fourth, and the fourth shall be richer than they all, and that would be Xerxes, and this is what it says of him. And by his strength and through his riches, he will stir up all against the realm of Grecia, of Greece, of Yavon, of Ionia. So the Bible, the, the prophecy then skips ahead and says this, and a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided to the four winds and not to his posterity or according to his dominion in which he ruled. And that's and Alexander the Great. That's Alexander the Great. So, yeah, even the Bible says, and whatever happens in Persia is not terribly relevant. But at the same time, and whatever happened in Greece is not terribly relevant. <laughs> I mean, it's all God's story. And, you know, you want to look closer at the story. There is much to learn. And there's all kinds of interesting things in both nations, in, in the Persian Empire and in the many city-states of Greece. It wasn't a nation. It was a collection of city-states, as you pointed out, that generally didn't get along with each other. And you can track the wars between the city-states. And if you have the patience for it, that's all fine and well. But in terms of the flow of redemptive history, there's nothing here that God points out as immediately pressing and in, in following the main thread of his story. So it's there, this is it contributes. Not the, the liberty, there's no victory of liberty no, and rationality no. that God is relying on here. No, <laughs> most certainly not. You, you would think that if this was uh, going to be significant to the flow of the gospel and the spread of God's kingdom, that God might have said, just, you know, dropped a little hint, thus bringing reason to the world or something, you know, I <laughs> don't know. Of course, what Alexander does do is uh, is terribly significant. He spreads a new trade language, mm -hmm. uh, Koine Greek. That's important. And so when we get to the New Testament, we find everybody everywhere is speaking a certain brand of Greek. Uh, God used the Greeks for that. Most of the other encounters with with Greek thought forms and Greek culture aren't all that great. Uh, Paul, of course, ministers in Greece and Macedonia first, and then in the Greek mainland below. Um, so Thessalonians, that's Macedonia, Corinth, that's Greece. He spent some time in Athens and on the Areop Areopagus confronts mm -hmm. the pagan philosophers with Jesus and the resurrection. Um, and so the on. The fact that they listened is pretty cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, they do get to be the showcase against which Paul presents the mm -hmm. gospel. And so in that sense, they're significant as an archetype of how we present the gospel to a world that has no knowledge of Christ. Most mm -hmm. of the sermons in the book of Acts are addressed to a Jewish audience who know the Bible. Mm -hmm. And and the, the apostles can walk through Old Testament history, and they usually go back to Abraham pass through David, come to John the Baptist, and then here's Jesus. But in Greece, on Mars Hill, um, Paul doesn't have any of those advantages, but he does appeal to something that had happened in their past when a plague had come to Athens, and they were forced to seek help from elsewhere, and a Cretan prophet said, offer sacrifices to the gods you don't know who might help you and see what happens, and it worked. 
And so they raised altars to this unknown god in the hopes that one day he would come back and interfere in their culture again. So Paul was able to say, without lying and without cheating, let me tell you about that god, because there's only mm -hmm. one god, and the god who saved you from the plague is the god I preach. And he mm -hmm. has appointed Jesus to rule and judge the world. So it, it, it is important to know about Greece. It's important to understand Greek culture and philosophy, and that's why we're going to spend a lot of time with it. Uh, there's not much more to say for Persia, uh, except... I would add one more yeah. thing about Greece in that, yeah. in some ways, it's not so much important in its own time, or even at the time of the Gospels, but the amount that later generations in the church mm. have used and depended yes. on Greek mm -hmm. ideas yes. and allowed, I mean, so many things from Greece have been... Um, interwoven into heresies and <laughs> things like that, that by understanding the origin, when somebody begins from them, A, we should already be suspicious. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Oh, you, you're starting for the Greeks. We already don't trust you, but continue. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, but just the the ways that, uh, and it's typically a false version of the of what Greece really was. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. That have, has then been um, interwoven, integrated into various parts because we take piecemeal, we take the things we like, yes. we ignore the things we don't. Um, but those things are very deeply embedded in our culture. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, everything in Western civilization. So, but I, I think in some ways that's actually a really interesting point for someone who wants to study history from a biblical starting point is look at what the Bible cares about. And the Bible thought that the only thing Greece was good for is the language that it gave us that it was written in, and then the opportunity of how to approach a completely pagan audience with the gospel. It didn't care about any of the happenings or the culture or any of the ways that they were involved with God's people. There, there's very little there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we will come back and talk about this a lot before mm -hmm. we're done. We'll, we'll be taking mm -hmm. several weeks at least with Greece. As far as Persia, the throne passes through a, a number of hands, um, sometimes through um, suicide or um, regicides within the palace itself. Uh, sometimes Persia tries to interfere a little more in Greece, but it, it doesn't come to a whole lot. And in in the end, um, it, it's the Greeks who go looking for the Persians. There is a man named Philip, lover of horses, who is, he's a, he's a Macedonian noble, and he's, he spends some time as a, as a prisoner in Greece. And, and, and there he learns to admire Greek culture. Uh, to our minds, Macedonian Greece, you know, it's like, sorry, Indiana and Illinois. It's not, <laughs> <laughs> it's all the Midwest. We do, we Californians don't know the, diff the fine differences, which I'm sure are wonderful and beautiful. Um, but uh, they're wonderful and beautiful if you're in Indiana. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Philip manages to get back home and tells everyone how wonderful Greece is. In fact, it's so wonderful, he needs to own it. <laughs> so he, as king, raises armies and descends upon Greece and the, the Greeks. Some cut deals with him and surrender. Some, like Athens, decide, no, we're going to stand up against this guy. And we'll come back and talk about this when the time comes. But he manages to secure Greece. And he turns his mind toward Persia. Because you got Macedonia, you got Greece. That's a lot of territory. That's a lot of manpower. That's a booming economy that can support a war. And, and this is a time which I, I don't know if we're a, exactly escaped from, but when you didn't really need reasons to go attack other nations besides you wanted something from them, like land or treasure or mm -hmm. a right a, a right away to the ocean or whatever, there was no real moral, thou shalt not start wars <laughs> command that anyone at anywhere really listened to. The only reason to not start a war is you might lose. That was, that was a valid reason, but that was about the only reason the ancient world really fitted, because those people out there weren't really people. They mm -hmm. were outsiders. They were them. They were the others. They, they, learned, they lived to serve us. So Philip's looking at, at, at Persia and thinking about it, and he dies. He has a son, Alexandros III, 
who picks up his father's dream uh, and, and sets his eyes on Persia. Uh, well, that, there, there's a lot of wealth there, but that, 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 that's, hmm, I don't know, I don't know. And he's, he would later say, and this, this is something that comes at the end of the story, and we'll come back to it when we talk about Alexander, but he would later tell his generals, while I was there thinking this through and debating it, I had this vision, this dream of a man dressed very oddly in robes and a turban and this golden breastplate and such. And I, I've never seen anything, you know, any barbarian dress like this before. He's obviously not Greek. And he was calling me to come into Persia uh, and guaranteeing that I would have complete success. So I took this, of course, to be a message from the gods, showing their great favor for me. And so I moved my armies into in, into Asia Minor and then down into Persia. And uh, we can dispense with Persia pretty quickly at this point, and we'll, we'll do it again when we uh, when we talk about Alexander in detail. Uh, Alexander attacked the Persian armies again and again and again, and their current emperor, Darius III, kept running away and backing off and retreating. Finally, he just ditched the battlefield and ran for it, <laughs> at which point his nobles caught him and killed him. And went to Alexander and said, hey, boss, you're in charge now. This guy's a jerk. What do you want? And so the Persian Empire passed into the hands of Alexander the Great, who consolidated his power and went on through Persia, past Persia, on toward India, until his Greek troops said, we're tired. We're going home. We're not going any further. And Alexander went into his tent and pouted, and his soldiers said, don't care, boss. Doesn't matter. We're going back. And according to one writer, Alexander bemoaned, they, my astrologers tell me there are other worlds out there and I have not even conquered one. Yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> and he went back into the heart of Persia. He went to, and found, interestingly enough, the, the remnants, what was left of old Babylon, and mm. said, hey, this would be a great place for the capital of the world. It's kind of centrally located. So, wow, you're the first person to think of that. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm just going to rebuild this city. He was dead very shortly after that, and his kingdom <laughs> splintered among his generals. And then the Hellenistic Age begins. The difference Hellenic means Greek of mm -hmm. Hellas, Hellenistic means Greek like, because mm -hmm. Alexander's soldiers and generals had taken over the known world. And just because he died didn't mean they went away. They were still in charge of various regions. His kingdom was divided among them. Greek language flourished. Greek literature and philosophy flourished. Um, he, he had planted a number of cities, including Alexandria mm -hmm. in Egypt, which became the cultural capital of the world. And sometimes the age just follows. It's called not the Hellenistic age, but the Alexandrian age. But that's in the future after we go back and pick up the remnants of Greece. But Persia passes away. Um, and, but does it? Because remember the, the vision, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of the humanoid statue. Mm -hmm. Each kingdom is but an extension of the one that went before and a preparation for the one that comes after. These four kingdoms were appointed to care for God's people, to preserve them intact until Messiah should come. Israel had had its chance at a great kingdom, and they blew it. They went into apostasy, and yet God continues to preserve his people, but he's going to use Gentiles to do it until the time of the Gentiles come and the gospel's ready to go everywhere. And so we can, we can look at Persia and Greece, and they hated each other's guts, and they saw all kinds of differences between the two. We look back and say, well, Persia at the beginning had a lot of influence from some very godly people. Think of Ezra and Nehemiah. Esther, uh, Mordecai, and others. But by the end, it was one more pagan empire that really didn't have a whole lot to offer the world, and God handed things off to Greece. Alexander was too busy to do a lot. We'll talk about his interaction with the Jewish people later. Um, but then his empire falls into these Hellenistic little kingdoms, and then they in turn are swallowed up by Rome, and then Jesus comes. So we're getting closer and closer um, Greece appears in Daniel's prophecies, but it does not appear in the Bible histories. Mm -hmm. um, God, the, with with the the Persian Empire reaching its strongest phase, God closes the historical book and will not reopen it until the coming of Rome. 
because what happens there, although some of it's prophesied, not enough changes for God really to worry about telling us a whole lot. Now, this this is hardly the first time. We, we speak of the 400 silent years. This is hardly the first time that God has gone silent. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, we tend to look at the Bible and think, wow, God was every day doing miracles and revealing himself by prophets. Really? No, not so much. There were a lot of it's very... It's because it was weird that they yeah. wrote about it. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of silent periods. This one was just a little longer than a lot of them. Um. But uh, the Bible's going to skip over Greece besides these prophecies. And when we show, when we the New Testament opens, we're in the Roman Empire, and it's already been around a little while, at least if you count Julius Caesar. Mm-hmm. So that's where we are. Yeah. And I'm going to guess that maybe we're within our time limit. Yeah, we should be wrapping up. Okay. Uh, it's just a, a thought that, you know, the ancient world is so different from today's world that we can look at these different cultures and really feel like they have more in common with each other than they would have ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> because we live so differently and we think so differently. But that reminds me of what C.S. Lewis says when he says, actual Christianity has so much more in common with ancient paganism than with <laughs> modern Christianity that it does bear some study in this. I mean, I remember, you know, you learn about the covenant and the structure of the covenant and biblical theology and this and that. And then you read about ancient Greek religion. And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, this is the cultural context where God gave this order of things, where they have this, they do have this concept of you belong to this God. And if you move, you got to leave that God behind. But that gives you an identity that where your identity is found in your God. And yes. I think that's something in modern Christianity that you really have to take a lot of time to explain nowadays, where your entire identity is in who you worship, and that's yes. who defines you. Yes, you are who you worship. You become like the one you worship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, every... shall we wrap up? Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was going to say the, the psalmist comment about idols, they that make them mm-hmm. are like unto them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we hope to be transformed in the image of Christ. Pagans become like their gods, but their gods in the long run don't see or speak or think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, yes, by all means, yep. let's move on with recommendations. All right. I can give one to start then. Yay. Great. Mine, okay, please do. Again, mine's a little different, but uh, given my recent experiences um, as a pastor's wife, I've had the opportunity to attend a regional church um, gathering of the the pastors and elders, and then more recently, a national church gathering of pastors and elders. And I have found in both of those instances, the, it has given me a greater appreciation for the individual men that make that up because I've seen often in recent years, a lot of generic condemnation of men in diff in reformed denominations and things like that, just generically being called all these names and being able to put faces and um, personalities to mm. to your not just your pastor and elders, but the others, and to see the body of Christ and its diversity even in a singular denomination um, has been very encouraging to me, and. Um, has made me appreciate the denomination I'm in more. So I guess my recommendation is if you have a church that has any kind of these gatherings, um, if they're open, which most of them are um, when they're outside of just the individual church, I recommend going to one sometime just to appreciate how much bigger the church is than what you see Mm -hmm. every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's wonderful. Emily? Um, I'm going to recommend... Gummy vitamins. <laughs> um, My children would approve. Yeah, I've, you know, I, I did lots of research on what prenatal vitamins were the best and all this stuff. And you know, some are better than others. One of the big things people talk about is methylfolate instead of folic acid. And you know, that's great. But you know, the best kind of vitamin is the one you will actually take. And for me, that is a gummy vitamin. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, make Indeed. the changes that will actually make a difference in your life instead of the ones you aspire to make in your life. That's my recommendation. That's a good one. 
Um, I am going to recommend a video. It's about Thermopylae. Uh, I'm trying to find it on, okay, History too. It was originally produced by or for the History Channel. Uh, the thing that makes it special, probably still makes it special, certainly did when it came out in 2004, was that the producers used state-of-the-art then <laughs> um, video game technology to show us the battle. Mm. So we see the war fought with little animated soldiers. And from our point of view now, it looks kind of hokey. But it does give you a good idea of how what the armies would have looked like and what the field commanders would have seen as they sat up on the hills and watched what was going on. And in terms of its history, it seems to be fairly accurate. Uh, and if you have a teenager who did is interested in military history. It's a, it's a good starting place. It's part of an entire series called Decisive Battles. Hmm. Um, so if you type in Decisive Battles, Thermopylae and History Channel, it should come up and you should How be able to find video? it on YouTube. Um, uh, that's um, a good question. Like, is it a 10 minute investment no, or is it an hour it's investment? At least, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to answer that, but unfortunately, it looks like it's about 22 minutes. Okay. Um, it's not super long. I know I played it in um, in my history classes before and got done with it without any difficulty as long as they start right away. So it's fun. I, I would recommend it. And I would also recommend some of the other battles in the same series. Hmm. The, the the man and woman who act as narrators are, are, are awfully handsome, beautiful, good-looking, stylish, and all that. <laughs> Could use some acting lessons. Um, but, you know, it's it's it's... Unless it's you a want lot to, to ask someone to be beautiful, fabulous, and a good actor. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So anyway, there you go. Decisive battles from the History Channel from Apollo. Great. Thank you. Thank you both also so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Um, thank you to you, our listener. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And if you would like to join the ranks of our financial supporters, you can visit our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Let us know if you have any questions, comments, bouquets, brickbats, questions, insults, etc. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. 